very good evening to all of you and welcome to the symposium 7 the last symposium of the parallel sessions today and we have kept the best to the last the seventh symposium will be fast forward to the future that will be in line with the theme of the conference and uh, the part of the theme of the SLMA this year as well moving to the technology because with the COVID-19 situation we were compelled to move into technology and this was one area that we want to move into anyway and we have a very eminent panel of resource persons to discuss the way forward and to take us fast forward into the future the first speaker is dr dujipa samarasekara is the director of the center for medical education national university of singapore he is a world renowned international medical educationist with interest in using technology in medical education. He has several credentials to his name. I will not be going into all these details right now because they have been, uh, those inputs have been given previously. So, Dujipa, uh, with the interest of time, we will move into the presentation. Over to you. Uh, thank you, Indika. And again, uh, I feel really uh, uh, privileged and, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, let me share my screen and also uh, I just want to share that uh, for some reason uh, today the internet here in Singapore at my home is uh, playing up. So I, I do hope that this will, <laughs> will manage to go through and I'm also using my mobile data. Uh, so hopefully uh, I'll be able to go through this entire presentation. Um, I think uh, good afternoon, everybody, and it's evening time here in Singapore. And um, my focus, I'll be focusing a little bit on uh, training the future healthcare professionals uh, uh, using contemporary educational methods. And of course, I'll be focusing on some of the technologies that are available. Uh, to start off with, uh, as I shared, I live in Singapore uh, and I'm from the uh, National University of Singapore uh, School of Medicine and uh, from the center uh, for medical education that is my home um, to start off with uh, I, I need to have this disclaimer uh, as per required by my institution what i'll be focusing is uh, the current disruptions and its impact on medical education especially covid and other areas the rationale for this change and also uh, how we can change best and also the contemporary practices uh, from personal experience. Because I feel that if, if, if we don't bring the, the, the practical aspects, our own experience of doing or uh, conducting, experiencing, uh, changing, evaluating some of these things that we have done now and projected to the future, uh, it's, like, uh, it's, like, uh, it's like advising uh, how to swim uh, without ever getting into water. So this is why I'm sharing some of these things. And certainly it's not to, to, to as we call, uh, to praise the monkey's own tail. Uh, so I would like to humbly share some of the things that we have done and what we have experienced as well. Well, to start off with, I love living in Singapore because you can, you can visit all these beautiful uh, uh, sites and Kovat 12th century Borobudur in Indonesia actually just before COVID I was there in the 9th century Watpo in Laos uh, these were uh, civilizations th hundreds of thousands of people lived but sadly now they are just tourist attractions right cities have disappeared uh, they were technologically advanced at that time but no more, and uh, and we, we are not just visiting them uh, and recovering from the jungle growth. We also saw all these beautiful things, technologically advanced, Kodak, you know, the, the Nokia phone. Uh, Nokia phone is coming back a little. The Xerox machine, which was really, you, without, uh, without which our office could not function. Uh, the BlackBerry Motion, everyone was proud to have one of those. Uh, Commodore Corp, you know, the, the very first computer, uh, and of course the Polaroid and a Palm Pilot, right? Uh, so these are, these are things that at that time, technologically very advanced, but they are no more. I think in the last 15 years of uh, Fortune 500 companies, uh, you can see that in 1955, 
uh, there was a 61 year lifespan in uh, the Fortune 500 companies, whereas in 2015, this lifespan has reduced to 17%. So 52% of the Fortune 500 companies have disappeared. Medical education and also medical practice is changing very fast. We are seeing a huge jump in the use of artificial intelligence in healthcare and also use of uh, virtual healthcare assistance. We are seeing the chatbots coming in in a big way in many places, uh, remote robotic surgery, which is very uh, in place in, in uh, Singapore and in, in many other places. So the, the healthcare is changing and also the practice of healthcare is changing rapidly to a more patient-centered value and cost-conscious care, uh, evidence-based coordinated care. Uh, also, we are getting our uh, physicians and practitioners to turn problems into question and then to continuously learn through questioning. Uh, we are also making sure our CME CPD programs are in place so that they complement one's experience with knowledge from evidence-based data and there's continuous learning. And we are also moving from individual competence to team competence so that they can provide better healthcare. With all these changes, we need to now look at medical education. And of course, the COVID crisis has also highlighted this. Um, there are several paradigm shifts in healthcare like commercialization, increased com commercialization of medicine, increased regulation of medicine, uh, medical legal climate, uh, with higher patient expectations, increasing burnout, and as I shared earlier, the disruptive technologies that are in place. But one of the, the things is that what I feel, and also from literature, that the medical education model not, has not changed significantly, even though the healthcare delivery model has changed. We still have very poor curricular planning and delivery models. We have very little uh, support to, for students to develop their cognitive skills. Most curricula are still largely lecture-based. Uh, poor training in domain independent skill sets like, independ uh, like interprofessional skills, uh, communication and professionalism skills. Uh, there's still time-based progression, uh, lack of supervision. There's little opportunity given for students to reflect, to discuss and to incorporate what they're learning and also their skill sets. So these are some of the challenges that we are seeing today. Our Lecture halls from the 20th century lecture halls have moved into these modern lecture halls, but they are still lecture halls, right? Where there's more didactics than more interactive lectures. This is our, the latest lecture hall at, at the, the School of Medicine. It's still a 350 seater uh, lecture hall. We are putting in a lot of money. Uh, we are moving from uh, dissecting cadavers to prosected specimens. It's still more or less uh, uh, prosected specimens and dissecting cadavers. We are moving increasingly to simulation, but it's still uh, monoprofessional learning rather than interprofessional learning. So have we really changed? Well, COVID crisis really pushed the boundaries, but there are concerns. The concerns are that I quote from the World Economic Forum that while some believe that unplanned and rapid move to online learning with no training, insufficient bandwidth and little preparation will result in a poor user experience that is unconducive to sustain growth. Others believe that a new hybrid model of education will emerge with significant benefits. So th there is also caution in this move because we are now seeing increased digitalization of medical education, moving into virtual hybrid, uh, online learning, virtual and uh, augmented learning, etc., across the medical education world. This very hurried and rapid move. So with all these, I think one thing is very clear. We need to adapt, we need to change, we need to be flexible, and we need to be innovative. And one important thing, I think Buckminster Fuller, who is a systems uh, engineer, who once said that you can never change something by fighting the existing reality. So to change something, we need to build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. I think this is important. So as we move to a new paradigm uh, of, uh, of teaching and learning, we need to understand that we need to actually create such environments so that these new paradigms can thrive, progress, and be sustained. 
So how do we do that? How do we actually, with all these inter disruptive changes to our learning environment and practice environment, how do we reimagine the medical school? And how can we reimagine and our teaching and prepare our students for our, and our specialists, uh, trainees like residents for their future practice? Well, I think the very first thing is that we need to understand what are the skill sets necessary for the 21st century. So let us look at some of the, the 21st century skill sets that are required. You can see that these are things like curiosity, initiative, uh, creativity, right? Critical thinking and problem solving, adaptability, uh, patience and grit that we need to build. And look at all the, the things that we, we are, how we are supposed to teach them. We are supposed to teach them by encouraging play-based learning, small groups, interactive, foster their relationships, uh, get students to, to work with each other and with appropriate challenges. So all small group changes. So how do we uh, incorporate all this. So this is my, I think the, the, the crust of my, uh, uh, the, the core uh, of my presentation today. I think we need to focus on three important principles. We have been fighting with all these things, but I think the most important thing is that we need to understand these principles. First is that we need to understand that there is no old, new, traditional, contemporary, regular, standard, innovative, integrated or discipline-based curricula. What it is, is that what do we want, the expected outcomes, or what do we want from our end product capabilities? What do we want from our students when they graduate and from our residents? So the very first thing is outcome. And here I'm going to give our own examples, how we redefined and, and moved into newer paradigms. So first of all, we were very clear. We want to be the best medical school in Asia and one of the best in the world. And that was undoubtedly very clear to all of us. So we want to be the best educational learning environment that would produce the best graduates for Singapore and to the region and to the world. And we want to be the best service provider as well as the best research university uh, in Singapore and in the world and in the region as well as in the world. Secondly, we want to align with the Ministry of Health initiatives. There was a big move that came through that focused on moving the, the, the patients from hospitals to community, move from quality to value, and also move healthcare from uh, move beyond healthcare to health. So the, 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 the government called this the three beyonds and the medical school also wanted to adapt to this and to, uh, to align with this. And together with this, about uh, three years ago, uh, thankfully just prior to COVID, <clears throat> we got together and we changed our mission, vision and values. I think the most important thing is that our vision is no longer focusing on just education or research or service, but it's to inspire health for all. And how are we going to do that? We are going to do that by nurturing doctors and nurses because nursing school is also under the medical school uh, to care for your loved ones and also develop researchers who would seek solutions for better health. And we are going to do this with the set of values, humility, compassion, integrity, and respect. So to do this, and as I shared earlier, we need to get our students from our classrooms to more small groups, leveraging on technology. And this is exactly what we have done. We have now moved more, more than our uh, entire curriculum, more than 40%. Previously, it was about 80% lectures and 20% for the small groups. Uh, but more formal curriculum we have moved into the in the preclinical years. More than 40% now are small groups and uh, interactive. Uh, we are going to increase this to, we, got, we are going to flip this as well. So this you can't do without leveraging on technology. And we have used a method called the collaborative learning cases where the students can either synchronous or asynchronous learn from on-site or off-site using the latest technology, uh, I mean, the, the technologies such as uh, Zoom, uh, Microsoft Teams, we use Microsoft Teams, uh, working together as small teams, solving problems and learning content. So harnessing technology and the appropriate technology with the, the relevant curricular design is extremely important. So 
to support this we have uh, we have also developed a whole suite of toolkits for e learning and also not only for e learning also for assessments right so all our assessments except the clinical hands on assessments are all online they are on exam soft or multiple exam soft we also use the the microsoft uh, especially the forms and also using zoom as one way of uh, evaluating uh, and also keeping uh, proctoring the students the clinical exams during the covid period went online again thankfully because we have developed the technologies and adapted them but uh, more, more or less uh, we will be in the especially in the final year uh, we will be having the real patients but again uh, leveraging on marking and etc using these uh, software tools because why we can then immediately examine the performance of our students and also uh, to see whether a specific item uh, or a station performed well and also we can evaluate the performance of each examiners so that we we know that the exam was fair for students and also reliable we are increasingly using simulation as i mentioned earlier but the twist is that we are using multi professional simulation we are in a good position because the medical school also uh, house the nursing school and the pharmacy school is just next door so medical nursing and pharmacy students are learning together uh, in our, especially during the the early formative years using the simulation center and also uh, developing the chatbots so that they can learn real time uh, uh, when they want the information as i shared earlier we are adapting the curriculum to individual students and we are now leveraging a lot on uh, virtual technology so we have the virtual interactive human anatomy which focuses on regional anatomy it started with upper limb now it is going into lower limb and also thorax and abdomen it is uh, it is a it's a adaptable uh, to the students and this is entirely developed in house uh, with collaborating with our computer school and our tech, uh, engineering school as well as our uh, school of architecture so this is an in house build uh, uh, solution which really adapts and are relevant to our own curriculum the next is the virtual interactive simulation environment, uh, environment which is also called the wise now the wise is a is a it's a also create it's a virtual environment especially to learn clinical procedures and clinical skills with haptics involved so again creating that environment and this has made again we have found uh, we have, through our evaluations we have seen that this has made uh, uh, huge strides in patient safety because the students are not just going and trialing it out on on patients they have to get through this they have to pass the the exams and also learn before we let out to practice or to examine uh, or use those procedures on uh, our patients uh the the school has invested heavily in developing these structures we have an entire uh, simulation hospital uh, that is housed it's uh, it's about uh, three floors of the entire 15 floors of this our uh, new building uh, which also houses other teaching facilities and the medical library as well but nothing none of this would actually help to develop the professionalism empathy compassionate care and that is where we have also focused both the co curriculum and the uh, the 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 parallel curriculum or the the the, uh, the curriculum which supports the main curriculum we, we the from the very first day our medical students two medical students and two nursing students are uh, allocated to a patient with a chronic illness or a family with a chronic illness this is the longitudinal patient experience which they will follow uh, throughout their uh, entire uh, undergraduate uh, uh, program and this is supervised by um, the the faculty and they visit the the home they learn the the issues challenges the family is facing they accompany them to the hospital or when they are admitted the patient is admitted they go and work with the with the patient and the others while they are doing their regular curricular work uh, there's increased number of uh, community services uh, we have developed what we call houses each student will belong to a house so the house will have students from year 1 to year 5 peer mentoring and near peer teaching and learning happens building that bonding and and community of learners uh these are also um, 
uh, the, the students are also exposed increasingly to senior role models who comes and share stories, narrative based about their own experience, challenges in these houses. Uh, so again, creating that bonding within the, the community, developing their professional identity. Uh, as I mentioned earlier about team learning, and also there's huge increased uh, research uh, focus. Uh, the students will get three months in year three and three months in year four, entirely allocated for their research development and research projects as well. Uh, as I mentioned, the students go across the region and also uh, globally with our partners uh, to understand about global health issues and challenges as well. The other is creating the innovation in students. So we have this medical grant challenge uh, for our students where the students get involved in identifying a gap in the community and developing a product. And the school supports this and it has become so popular and really value add not only to the student community, but also uh, finding and uh, answers to some of the common problems that we have uh, faced. We have now put this as a new innovation track for students. And this is where students are developing apps to help elderly. Uh, students are developing robots uh, to, to dementia patients, to keep them uh, uh, under watch. Uh, so a new creativity uh, and the creativeness uh, we have, we are trying to encourage nurture within the medical school. My second most important principle is that curriculum is never static. You need to review, refine and reform. And we have to do this very, very carefully because if you have, if, if like John Cotter mentioned, if you handle the challenge well, you can prosper greatly. But if you handle it wrongly, you can put everybody at risk and danger. So one of the very common problems we are seeing across is that clinicians and preclinical or paraclinical teachers always clashing and not agree. So we took a different approach. We, our entire curriculum is driven by entrustable professional activities. And what we have shared is that we have got the, all our clinical uh, faculty as well as the extended faculty together. And we asked the question, what's medical science content clinicians want students to know to achieve these entrustable professional activities. And similarly, we asked the pre and paraclinical teachers, what are the foundational knowledge that the students need to meet cut across the, the different systems, as well as what medical science te uh, teachers want students to know to understand the clinical medicine. And then by getting them to develop these and then a committee to work throughout the, the, the the commonalities and uh, the, the ones that are not very uh, agreeable, we come to common understanding what is necessary and what needs to be done. And through this, I have seen that over the last uh, 10 years or 15 years, 15 years, uh, about three major curricular changes aligning quickly to the, to the needs of the community and the needs of the patients. Well, uh, our curriculum is a more spiral curriculum and it is based on uh, epi-systems and foundations, uh, system-based modules with capstones. Um, the entire curriculum, as I mentioned earlier, is based on entrustable professional activities with 274 concerns and conditions, with 23 knowledge, skills, attitudes, and with six key outcomes based on our mission statement, as I shared with you earlier. The third is that no curriculum exists in isolation. It is part of a system. So what is what we are seeing is that our undergraduate and, and the residency program are now seamlessly integrated. And how do we do that? Because now all of the three medical schools belongs to what we call a health academic health cluster. So we belong to the National University Health System and it is supported by a team of faculty who are what we call the integration lead educators, which will integrate across not only undergraduate, it cuts across from undergraduate to the specialty training as well, as well as discipline specific educators who will teach students more in depth core into a particular area. And of course, the medical educationalists like myself supporting this faculty as well as promoting research evaluation and policy development to support the curriculum. So the medical schools and the centralization through the health systems, healthcare institutions, and also the schools 
and made it possible for us to seamlessly integrate it across. And these are also supported by the structural changes, the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Education coming together uh, as the National University Health System, incorporating the medical school, the nursing school, uh, faculty of dentistry, uh, faculty of uh, uh, the public school of public health and the National University Hospital. This happened in 2008, but now, uh, so we have the three missions, education, uh, clinical care and research. But now after about uh, 12 years, we have 20 organizations, healthcare institutions joining the National University Health System. Um, we have the medical schools, but also we have also the, the primary care, the secondary care, tertiary care and quaternary care hospitals and, and training institutions joining us so that this continuity of education can continue and we can harness the faculty, not only from the medical school, but from all three schools, from medicine, nursing, dentistry, and public health, but also from the hospitals uh, across the, the, the academic health cluster. Uh, we call it from the cradle to the, to the grave. We have now uh, all the training facilities, as well as the specialists to support our medical students and our residents and our nursing students as well. But one more important thing is that we must not forget our students, faculty, and patients. And we need to know that they are from different generations. So how do we do that? We need to build trust. We need to make sure that what we do are relevant and purposeful, and what we are doing are analytical and creative. Now, if you, if you focus on these areas, we will see our teachers and facilitators post-COVID be creative and adaptable. They will develop new skill sets, harnessing technology appropriately and effectively so that they will drive their students into proper learning behaviors. They will understand different technology tools. They will be benevolent, caring, compassionate, and collaborative towards students and residents. And also they will develop good communication skills using interactive technologies. They can't do this unless we support this. So I'm very thankful to the university because this is a $1 million uh, uh, gift to the, to the faculty, the community. This is what we call the Imaginarium. Uh, so this is uh, housed in the, the, the library where this is only for, for faculty. The faculty can go to this facility, get involved, immersed in all the technologies uh, that is available. Uh, and then you just need to think how you are going to use these technologies in your teaching or your assessment. So this is only open for the, for the faculty uh, where you can go play around with all the technology tools and even play games. You can see on the bottom, there's, an, there's motorcycles, there are games that you can play, virtual games. But the most important thing is that for us, the technology adapters, uh, the generation uh, uh, X or Y to at the end to think through and to see how we are going to adapt this in our students and use it in students. So this has really helped again for the faculty to understand. So I think it is important that we are using technology. We need to provide those facilities. We need to provide the relevant uh, faculty development, allocate the resources, develop clear faculty policies and guidelines because now faculty promotions as well as uh, progression, uh, the, the remuneration, the bonuses are also create, uh, are also structured around the adapting of new technology usefully and relevantly to our students and our residents. And also uh, we need to ensure that it is a nurturing uh, so that we build a community of practitioners or community of learners. So how we need to, as I shared, this is the way we co-create our future, right? Use more to bounce forward in the post COVID era. We have to have more technology enabled learning models. We need to have students centered adaptive curricula with a focus on developing practice relevant skills by personalizing learning and training by developing highly skilled and engaged teachers and also making sure that our practitioners are future ready they are effective, efficient, and safe, who can deliver quality care to patients and their communities. So my take home message is that there's no magic bullet, right? We have to have good alignment 
we need to focus on what we want, the end product capabilities of our graduates and how we can achieve them. And then the most important is that we need to develop a community of educators. We need to invest, develop, nurture and sustain our faculty. And without getting our faculty on board and developing them and working with them, all this is going to get lost, right? Technology will be wasted. We will be investing in un useless and uh, uh, technologies which will not be adapted by our teachers. Our teachers will be ignorant within inverted commas so that they, they don't know how to move forward in the post-COVID. And also our support structures, our incentives, etc., will be quite misaligned with what is necessary. So we need to recreate our future or co-create our future by taking care of our faculty, thereby the faculty will take care of our students and residents and adapt to all this. With that, I want to thank uh, Professor Indika Karnathilaka and the SLMA Organizing Committee. And I do hope to stay on with the end of this workshop to answer questions. Uh, hope with, with, uh, with, with my internet, uh, hopefully not playing up. Uh, so with that, thank you very much. Back to you, Indika. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dujipa, um, from the insights from Singapore. Uh, that's paved way for our um, uh, next session. Uh, for the past few months, we have seen a lot of innovations coming through, and uh, um, I can't think of anyone better than Professor Rangika Halwatura, Commissioner of Sri Lanka Inventors Commission, to shed insights and um, uh, give us um, his views in terms of what's taking place. And I invite you, Professor Halvatura, uh, to deliver your session on go back to human mode from auto mode. Uh, uh, if I go back to my topic, my, my topic is go back to the human mode from the auto mode. So uh, I was talking about Dr. Didupa's uh, presentation and he was talking about uh, the state of the technology and he was talking about in and around Singapore and in and around uh, things which are going back to fifth, uh, century. So uh, I was, uh, I'm going to start my presentation at a different page. That is this, I'm going to talk about the same technology, but uh, going back to say, uh, first century or even before, uh, before that, I have put uh, four uh, examples. Number one, what is, uh, what you can see at the top is uh, Dambulu Lena. And uh, uh, the reason for me to select that particular example is that to show you how we can uh, preserve the, the natural landscape and do a marvelous creation. And look at the, the, the paintings there. They, they, they never used any, any sort of a uh, nanotechnology based uh, painting. They, they got the, they extracted the materials from the, the nature, maybe uh, food or maybe soil. So finally they managed to create a marvelous uh, creation, which last, still lasting and which is more than now 50 or 1,500 years. The next one uh, is from my own uh, field, civil engineering, that is called Bisokoto. I'm not going to talk about the, the technology behind Bisokoto, but I'll, I'll pitch one uh, point uh, related to uh, Bisokoto. That is, if I take the first ever Bisokoto built in Sri Lanka and the last Bisokoto built in Sri Lanka, if you compare the technology, if I say the technology was the same, you may laugh at me saying, I mean, the technology cannot be untouched, unchanged. That is what uh, Dr. Dijiva was continuously talking. Every day, every second, the technology should change. You take your mobile phone, right? This came as a gadul bag. If you can remember, this came to Sri Lanka as a gadul bag, and only few uh, the top class people managed to use this, mainly the politicians. So they, they use this for any, I mean, they could use this for any, 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 any purpose. If they want to take a, make a call, they could use it. If, they, if there's a small challenge still, he could use the same mobile phone. So that is how this came to Sri Lanka. And that started shrinking, shrinking, shrinking. And now, thanks to uh, the smartphone, it's again going, expanding. So that is the, the technology you and I know, you and I believe. But this particular technology, which I was talking, which is more than 2,000 years old, was never changed from first to the last. So one could say the people who invent that particular technology, or rather who was 
going with the technology doesn't know the real meaning of the technology, but that is not the real truth. The first ever Bisoko to build in Sri Lanka that was built with 100% accurate technology. With 100% accurate technology, our so-called leaders will definitely change that. But these, uh, the rulers of the country, they showed the real sustainable politics. So they found something which is interesting, which is with 100% technology, so they never change. So that is the second uh, uh, image I was uh, showing you. The middle image, that's the image of Yodala. When I say Yodala, again, the people who doesn't know about Yodala will laugh at me. What is this? I mean, you are a civil engineer, but you are talking, uh, you're, you're talking about a uh, 3.2 kilometers long canal. I'm very sure all of you have visited many countries and you have seen a lot of canals across the cities, across countries, even you know, linking two countries. But this particular alert, or the, the canal, is only 3.2 kilometers long. And one side you have the village, the other side you have the urge one. So everybody, every civil engineer still proudly say, this is one of the best creation of the world. Why is that? The reason is nothing other than the slope. The slope is only 10 to 15 millimeters for one kilometer. This is out of soil, not out of concrete. If you do it today with all this, uh, the sophisticated technologies we have, I'm very sure still we not, will not be able to make that particular slope. Just imagine, I mean, just close your eyes and try to imagine the technology today and technology what they had they are and see how they have done it. If you do it today, I'm very sure you will take a drone, fly up and you foresee what is, what are the obstacles uh, uh, next to that. But these people, they also had a drone that went up to only 30, 40 feet. That's a nearby tree. They climbed the tree. They looked about 50, 50 meters maximum, but still they managed to find the correct contour connecting two tanks, right? Connecting two tanks going 3.2 kilometers untouched using the natural materials. Unbelievable. The, the very last one, Seagiria, I'm very sure all of you know what is Seagiria. Kala uh, Yodala was built by Datusena, King Datusena, and that's why he was killed by his own son, King Kashapa, and he built Seagiria. And he ruled the country only for 18 years. Within 18 years, with that particular mentality, he killed his own father. And his brother went to India and he never knew when that particular guy will come and get the power back. So he's with that particular mentality. Just imagine your car was hit, uh, or rather uh, uh, animal was hit by your car. How many days you are going to suffer? How many days? Definitely you will suffer at least one or two months. This guy, he killed his own father, and his father, the, the brother is in India, he will come and capture the, uh, the palace again. With that particular mentality, he built this particular beautiful, uh, I mean, uh, palace. And I mean, if you get that particular point itself, you could, I mean, I myself can say, this is the best wonder of the world. So we are coming from a, a era which, you know, uh, which had this particular technology. So from the technology, if I move to another subtopic, the food and agriculture, from the main dish to the side dish, and to the deserts, the people who lived about 500 or 1000 years ago, they managed to grab from this, grab from his own land. Maybe not from uh, his own land, as a, as a cluster, if you take a few uh, houses in a village, so they, are, they were self-sustained, right? They managed to share the, the things. With that, they managed to, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, create the uh, social relationships, social cultural relationship be within the, the cluster. And they managed to proudly say they are self-sustained. I'm, I'm kind of requesting you to compare this with the today, the, uh, the uh, I mean, the modern era 
where you and I live. This is about the agriculture. I mean, from uh, the paddy to the side dishes, to the uh, no, deserts, you had everything within your own cluster. Your, your self-sustained. The next topic is your own field, medicine. You talked about the Ayurvedic medicine, actually that is not really belongs to us. It came with uh, King Vijay, I mean he came from India, he brought this uh, Ayurvedic medicine. Before that we had our own medicine. And we, we, we I mean you are, you, are, you are representing a country which has the oldest hospital in the world. Right? Sri Lanka, you know, can claim as the oldest, the country with the, with the oldest hospital. You go to uh, Mihintale, still you can see the remains of uh, one big hospital. It's not like uh, the sophisticated hospitals which, uh, uh, which uh, Dujeep uh, brought from Singapore. But still, that managed to treat the people in a very human manner. The, the very, uh, uh, your left corner image, that is from uh, Polonnaru Hospital, and uh, the clay pot, you, we were talking about uh, keeping drugs at a known temperature with a known humidity. So these clay pots managed to keep the drugs at a known temperature, at a known humidity. They never knew about these terminologies, humidity and the, the temperature, but they managed to learn from the nature and try to adopt it. I, I'm not a uh, surgical expert, but the people believe, the archaeologists believe, these two uh, instruments they use for brain surgeries. I don't know, I mean, you are the people who can judge that. But still, one thing you have to understand that we had a very strong treatment technique within the country. That is not the Ayurvedic medicine. You know, King Buddha Das, I mean, he even treated, go and treated the animals. So we are coming from that sort of a Era. So let me uh, change your mind to the world today and the modern world. If I just take, uh, try to replace uh, the three topics which I was talking with you with the previous slides, the technology, you take your mobile phone, I'm very sure you'll not be able to find a single thing which you can't do with your mobile phone. Think of a doctor, he's here inside. You won't believe USA has recently developed an app you just take the, uh, the phone, you inhale to the phone, and that can detect 18 diseases. So why you need doctors hereafter? It's all inside. Engineer, it's really nothing. If the doctor is inside, the engineer is really nothing. So all the professions are inside now. So you think of anything, it's there inside the phone. And we have landed to Mars, uh, the, the, the moon, and we are, we are planning to move to the, the Mars. And if you think about the, the food, I never learned growing a plant without soil. But now, today, it's all hydrophonic. So you plant things without a single drop of soil. Another different creature. You can't claim this as a, a cow, cow or a bull. You need more food. That is what uh, the human expectation. So the, uh, the scientist they created a creature by changing the genes and you will not be able to call this guy as a bull anymore. It's a meat bull now. Another guy, I'm very sure you have seen two types of cocks in your life. Both have uh, two legs, am I right? Two types of cocks. One in buses and the other one is in cages. But this cock is slightly different than uh, to, the, to the, the, the two cocks you have seen. This cock, actually in the chicken industry, when I was a kid, the chicken, the broiler chicken, it's 48 days. From the, the egg to the uh, two, 5 pounds or 2.5 kilos of uh, meat bowl, it will take about 48 days. But this whole process has, a, has two big issues. One is to keep the, the creature uh, healthy until it die. That is number one. The number two, you kill the creature and remove the feathers. Those are the two main issues in the chicken industry are the scientists. They found a new creature. They, in, they changed the, the genes. They, they took this particular feather out and they created a creature without feathers. And the, uh, the, the most interesting part is you take the broiler chicken industry today from egg to the 
the five pound or 2.5 kilos of chicken meat bowl, it will take only 18 days. 18 days, two and a half weeks. That creature can't even think of dying. It will be killed and sent to your plate. Unbelievable. The medicine. You think of a disease today, unfortunately we couldn't still find a uh, drug for the COVID, but any other disease, you think a, a disease today, the next day you'll be able to get the drug. But the countries like Sri Lanka, much more advanced than that. Sometimes you'll get the drug, then they will realize the disease is not there. The next plane, you'll get the disease as well. So we are very much fortunate to be in a developing country. So that is the modern state-of-the-art technology we are talking. I'll not be able to finish my uh, modern day or the, uh, the today's uh, technology without talking about the artificial intelligence. I mean, you think of anything, even your, your, your smartphone, your, your, your vehicle, you think of any uh, equipment you use today, it's with artificial intelligence. You all know Pandit Amaradeva, I mean, he died. But if you really want to listen to his music, you'll be able to make a robot which can sing or even you know, play the violin to the same tune as Pandit Amaradeva. So as, I mean, we are that much of advance in terms of technology. You may not know, uh, 2017, uh, one called Sofia, Saudi Arabia has given the citizenship. So we are living in an era where the robots got the same equal rights as a human. Don't worry, the, uh, the person who is sitting next to you, I'm very sure it's a, it's a human. But when you're traveling overseas, Sometimes the person who's sitting next to you may be a robot. So we are living in an era, the world has changed to that level. This guy, uh, 2017, I, uh, I managed to go to Japan uh, to attend a science and uh, technology conference. And this man was the keynote speaker there, Mr. Abe, the prime minister of uh, Japan. So he came uh, and he was talking about uh, one single technology developed uh, by Japanese for one hour. The technology was nothing other than this, a tractor. Let me uh, make it very short and sweet and explain what he was talking for one hour. He was very proud and he was talking about this particular tractor. This tractor can do the farming, keeping one inch distance each other and communicating each other. I mean, just imagine two tractors doing the farming keeping one inch distance and communicating each other. That is the technology which Japan is talking these days. The very next day, I had to come to uh, the airport from their, through their subway, and I met this particular couple with, uh, with their kid. Very interesting, don't, I mean, don't misunderstand me. I mean, I, 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 didn't, take, I, I didn't take this particular uh, the photo because, because of the, uh, the beautiful lady. There was a reason behind for me to take this particular uh, the, uh, the, the figure, uh, the, the photo. I was traveling with them for 45 minutes. Throughout that journey, the mother, she was holding the phone, both hands, and working with the computer, uh, working with the, uh, the smartphone. The father, very interesting. Father, one hand, he was holding the, the pram. The other hand, he also working with the phone. Most interestingly, the kid is less than, I think, I'm very sure he's less than one year. You imagine a kid with uh, less than one year old staying for 45 minutes. You won't believe this guy never make a small hmm noise. He was looking at the backside of the, the two phones and he was going with the parents for 45 minutes. These days we were talking about the social distancing, but I experienced social distancing three years ago in Japan. Within the same own cluster, father, mother, and the kid touching each other, not even a single word. The previous day, the prime minister was proudly talking about a technology, two tractors keeping one inch distance, communicating each other. If you think this is the development, this is the technology, I'm sorry to say, I don't want to say this technology crossing the Indian Ocean and reaching my beautiful country. So this is what has happened with the technology. Let me fast forward my presentation. I saw uh, there was a notice. Okay, this is uh, the the technology and the development. I mean, we have 
We have changed the cross-section of the cities. We are going not vertical, now we are going uh, not horizontal, we are going vertically up, right? We, 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 I mean, we, uh, the, the face masks were familiar to us after COVID, but uh, the Chinese, Japanese, even Indians, they started using this uh, purified uh, uh, the mask three, four years ago. You, uh, do you know, uh, for a year, we burn 6.5 trillions of cigarettes. If you count that to a single day, it is 16 billion cigarettes per day. You just burn out. And one cigarette bud can contaminate one liter of water. We have 7.8 billion population in the world. Out of 7.8 billion, one billion, they don't have good food to eat. They don't have one billion, they don't have water to drink. And you won't believe, per day, 5,000 die without proper drinking water. But in the world, every day, we burn 16 billion cigarettes, and that will contaminate 16 billion liters of water. This is before and after COVID, and see how the, the environment, the nature is changing with time. So this is about the agriculture. I was talking about the, the state of the agriculture. And the, the govia is now mod. The mod govia go to the field with, the, with a smartphone. All the, the details are monitored through a phone now. And uh, we distance the nature from the field. And we say it's uh, much more efficient and productive. And far away down the line, we brought another issue. That is wildlife and human conflict. So that is what, is, what has happened to the country and to the world. I'm not going to talk about your profession, that is medicine. I took three uh, examples. I took, um, I'm going to talk about two here, because you know what has happened to your profession and your fail. So that is not the real challenge, actually. The challenge is this. By 2030, you need to produce 50% more, uh, more energy, 50% more food, and 30% more, more water. So there are a lot of challenges with that. Another 10 years down the line, we had to double, or rather, made 50% extra food and water and energy. So none of these things are, say, computer jail marts. So these are, these are happening. We're talking about the COVID. But the COVID is not the real disaster. The climate change is a real disaster. 98% of the, the population who are affected due to climate change are from the developing countries. That is you and I. So uh, this is what we plan to work with the artificially intelligent uh, robo. But exactly, this is what we have done to the world. Every step we put forward, we destroy the nature. We destroy the nature. It's time for us to turn back and see what we are doing. If not, you can see what is going to happen to us in the near future. So a uh, very interesting uh, cartoon, again, I found from the internet. So this guy is like you and I. He, he talks with the, uh, the sun. He, he talks to the sun and say, Look, I mean, you go to your settings, you go to your display, go to your brightness, please reduce your brightness level. I can't live anymore. It's really hot. Then the sun replies and say, I'm sorry, I haven't done any change to my settings. You go to your settings, you reduce your concrete jungles, you, you, you increase the number of trees. In very simple terms, he say, you go back to your human mode from your toe mode. You go back to your human mode from your toe mode. I know this is not the real audience to talk about this statement, but I will tell that here. I'm very sure you'll be able to pass that to the 225 people who are sitting middle of the, the beautiful lake. Vanasi Matamulai, Mula Matakavima. Well, when I say uh, we need to think back, but the world is changing. If you take the, the development as an egg, snake is basically coming behind us to go and see what are our roots, but we are still hanging on his tail and say that is the development. World is changing from tourism, clothes, uh, uh, what we eat. If I take just uh, one or two examples, you know about posh shopping. I'm, I'm very sure the, the female knows about it. Five years or six years down the line, the posh shopping was you take uh, a transparent uh, polythene bag, you go to a supermarket, get the beautiful shiny vegetables and fruit, put it there and that was the posh shopping. But now you go back to the village and you get the vegetables with tips. Think about the tourism. Tourism, 
you were looking for star hotels. But now, people again going back to the village, to the jungle, and say the ecotourism is the best. You won't believe there are hotels in the in the country inside a jungle, small uh, tent per head. The value is hundred thousand rupees. So the world is changing. I mean, I was talking. I was I was I was trying to talk about uh, a a very simple concept. But I, I didn't want you to go uh, home and spend hours and days to think what I was talking. A simple uh, fact, if I try to compare the past and the now, then and now, the people who lived in this country, say 500 or 1,000 years ago, they knew one very interesting fact, that they knew that they are going to die one day. Our people, even at the ICU bed, we try to stay one more additional minute. Even myself, I'll do the same. But if we spend all the days as an inhuman, and if you try to achieve another additional day, what is going to happen? It's again to live as an inhuman. So if you want to live one additional day, please try to live that as a human. For that, you need to go back to your human mode from your Uto mode. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rangika for that uh, fascinating, beautiful presentation, very insightful. And uh, all these presentations during the SLMA conference will be video recorded and will be available, distributed in social media. So hopefully the messages will find its way to the uh, 225. Uh, our next presenter is Dr. Dini Labegunwardana, uh, my good friend. And uh, he is very much focused on visual and media communication. That is his main interest area, uh, other than medicine. And uh, he's a director of the Institute of Multimedia Education, which SLM is doing a lot of collaborative work. And this conference also is uh, conducted in collaboration with IME. Over to you, Dinil. Hello everyone, and I born. And before I start, start uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Indik Karnathilaka, uh, for that introduction and for uh, inviting me to speak here. And uh, after after hearing uh, what Professor Halwatra said, and before that, Dr. Dujipa Samrasekara, right? Dr. Dujipa Samrasekara said, uh, "Look, I mean, uh, fast forward to the future, and what's the topic?" The topic given to me is new frontiers in medical communication. Um, so when this was given to me, I started thinking. Now, as Indika said, uh, we teach visual communication, about audiovisual communication, about the basics of communication to our students. And then, you know, as a medical person, and, uh, you know, after seeing so many things that happen in the field, I was wondering, what should I talk about? So here's what I did. I spoke to a few people. I spoke to uh, 12 doctors. So because I was so confused, I made a few phone calls. I spoke to 12 doctors, out of which eight were consultants, right? Six medical students, uh, eight friends who are absolutely non-medical. And then I spoke to four family members as well. And uh, after doing all that, I completely changed my mind. So when I, when I heard the topic, New Frontiers in Medical Communication, what came to my mind was uh, something like this, right? I mean, from old to new. Stuff like IoT, AI, AR. But instead, you know, rather than talking about this stuff, I thought I'd speak about something completely different. And I rewrote the, the whole topic this way. Fast forward to the future, just look at the, the, the visual hierarchy. Fast forward to the future, new frontiers in medical communication. 
So let's start. The origin of the word communication. Now this begins, this, this comes from Latin, okay? Word communis, not communist, communis. But it has the same root, okay? Or communicare means common or to share. So with that in mind, let's look at a sort of a common definition about uh, communication. By the way, there's no universally agreed definition about the concept of communication, but you can say it's the process by which information is exchanged between individuals. But for us to have a better understanding, let's have a look at an expanded version. The process the process of transmitting information. It's a bit of a verbose uh, definition, so let's, let's, let's take, a, take a bit of time and read it. The process of transmitting information, thoughts, opinions, messages, facts, ideas, or even emotions. And I have put this, this next word in quotes, understanding, from one person place or thing to another person, place or thing. Now, Professor Karnathilaka can write an email, right? Send it to Dr. Samarsekar in Singapore. So that is from one place to the other, right? Or from here to the Faculty of Medicine, or from his computer to some other computer, which means from one thing to the other. Now, here's another thing I did. I just put some keywords into Google, and I looked for some graphics, right? When I put word communication into this, these are the graphics we get. Look at them. There's something that is very common here. Have a look, please. Each and every graphic has people in it, right? Maybe it's from Paris to somewhere, maybe it's from one location to the other, but it's between people. So point number one I want to highlight is communication is always personal, okay? So when we talk about personal communication, person-based, let's think about this, right? As medical people, how do we receive and interpret communications, or for that matter, how do we interpret anything? Interesting, isn't it? Like this. Apologize for putting this sort of a very juvenile and a rudimentary uh, graphic for a medical audience, but this is how we interpret things, isn't it? By using our five senses, the way to send inputs to our brain is through our five senses. Now, out of this, Two are very important, hearing as well as vision. Because taste is there, smell is there, touch is there. Unless you are going to touch, lick, or smell someone. The, the more main modes of communication that we are going to use is audio and visual. So let's bring, put all these things together and sort of make a medically sensible working definition for the concept of communication. So this is what I want, the first thing, you know, I want to emphasize on is all communications at the very core are interpersonal, mostly audiovisual information exchanges, right? So with that in mind, let's have a look at the concept of medical communication. Now, as per American Medical Writers Association, medical communication is the development and production of materials that deals specifically with medicine or healthcare. Have a look at this. From our Sri Lankan perspective, this is also very interesting. There's an association called American Medical Writers Association, right? Consisting of non-medical people as well as medical people. All right. Now, this one is from CDC. Again, you know, a bit verbose. Therefore, let's take a tiny bit of time and go through this. Health communication is the study and use of communication strategies to inform and influence decisions 
and actions to improve health. Let's come to the next part. See, decisions and action to improve health. Let's have a look at the next part as well. The health communication and social marketing practices at CDC draw on the work of scholars and practitioners in a wide range of sciences and disciplines. That is probably not that important to us, but let's read the other bit as well. Having a science-based strategic communication process helps us address public health challenges. Let's read this underlying part. Right? Have a look, please. The process includes using multiple behavioral and social learning theories and models, then identifying steps to influence audience attitudes and behavior. What does this mean? A communication has to have a purpose, right? Otherwise pointless, right? In our case, influence audience attitudes and behavior, whatever that audience is. So let's put everything together and have a look at it. So what or how should an interpersonal, mostly audiovisual, information exchange designed to change a behavior look, feel, and sound like? Right? That's the question I wanted to ask. Right. The answer itself is actually here. What or how should an interpersonal the highlighted bits. It's mostly audio and visual, right? It has to be personal, right? Ob obviously, it has to be audio and visual, and there has to be information, valuable information, right? For a communication to be complete, it has to be an exchange. And remember, it has to be designed as well. And the purpose? To change a behavior. Right, let's look at each and every word separately, personal. So how can a communication be personal? Let's look at it from a medical point of view. Let's say you are sitting somewhere looking at a patient, talking to someone, right? Can you make the communication personal? You are talking to a colleague about something. Can you make it personal? Can you target for the specific audience? Right? These are, these, are, these are a few pointers that I want to give you based on everything that we have talked so far. What is targeting? Let's say, uh, again, let's say you are an orthopedic surgeon who is uh, going to do a joint replacement. Do you talk the same way to an eight-year-old grandma from a village and to an engineer who comes to you, right? Do you target your communications, right? Based on this, we can think about using new frontiers as well, right? Can you have a presentation explaining everything on your laptop or on your mobile device, right? But targeting to two audiences, maybe the same set of pictures. Do you have two stories to tell? Do we think about these things, right? And do we base the content on, on the common knowledge of the audience? That's the other thing I wanted to ask, right? What does that mean? Now, a person from, let me give you an example from outside medicine, right? Let's say uh, you can grab a piece of chalk or pastel or whatever, make some abstract lines, right? Just, just do this in your head with me, right? And as you do this, a shape like Dagaber appears, but it's very hard to see. You show it to any Buddhist grandmother who goes to temple every day, that person is going to see a Dagaber, because that's based on that particular person's common knowledge, right? Show it to a foreigner, who has never seen a temple, is he or she going to understand that, right? So what I'm trying to say is, although we think our language is not abstract, it is abstract. It is abstract within the domain. The moment we take it outside the domain, we have to bridge that abstractness and make sure that people understand what we say, 
Okay? And of course, use methods that they know. Right? What, what do I mean by that? Again, let's use the same, same, same example. Right? Now, let's say um, there's, a, there's a particular disease condition for which we have to educate the public. We want to do some sort of a campaign and one particular the target group is elderly people for, the, for a particular condition that they are suffering from. And let's say the other condition is for youngsters. Now, how do you think we should approach this? Should we make a very sophisticated app that can work on the latest mobile phone and deploy it if we want to reach that elderly audience? So on the other hand, do you think right, a very verbose a pamphlet would work on youngsters? So basically, use methods that they know. Right? Let's look at the audio. Now, that was, you know, I was talking about the personal bit, targeting. Then we talked about the audio bit. It's audiovisual, isn't it? So what about the audio? Clarity, right? Clarity in every sense of the word. The message has to be clear, the sound has to be clear, the words have to be clear, the meaning have to be clear. And then by all means, avoid unnecessary sounds. Right? We go to so many hi-fi websites to find a bit of information. What do we get? A bit of boring music playing at the front. No, we don't need that. We go to a particular place to grab a bit of information, not to hear the music. So the last bit is the same, so I'll skip to the next slide. Then visual, right? It's audio-visual. So what about the visual thing? Visual is the most important modality of communication. For the simple reason, remember the, the, the previous slide I showed you with, uh, with the five senses? Now, if it, to this particular audience, I don't need to say, but nevertheless, I will. If you take all the data that goes to your brain from all your five sense organs, more than 95% of the, of the impulses actually start in your eyes. Okay, so whether you like it or not, we are visually hardwired. Okay, so therefore we have to put a lot of emphasis on visual communication, right? Let me, let me explain it in a, in a different way as well. Let's say we bring someone in here completely blindfolded, all right? And then for a second we take the blindfold out and let the person see, the, see what happens here, right? That person requires just a split second to understand where he or she is, what's in front of him or her, and what's going on here. Right? Now try to explain everything that happens here and what's here in words. How long does that take? Right? That is how fast and important the visual communication is. And as doctors, this is something that we need to use. We need to study it. Right? And when we deploy it again, we have to use methods that our audience understand. Of course, there has to be information, right? What does that mean? Stick to what is necessary. There's no point going on and on about unnecessary stuff. The attention span of humans is limited. We know that, isn't it? Right? So uh, someone like uh, Indica can explain this far better than I do, right? This is why we designed lectures with, a, with you know, I mean, maybe, you know, uh, 20 minutes of hardcore information and then stuff to consolidate stuff because our attention span is limited, right? And the other thing what we need to understand is people don't care about how much we know or what we know. What people want is, you know, basically how, but what they want to understand or what they want to get from us is how our knowledge or whatever we can deliver can make them better, right, when we deliver something. So deliver what's necessary and again, use the methods they know. And for, a, for anything to be complete, 
and information has to be, a communication has to be an exchange, right? A true communication is an exchange. So basically, listen, understand, and get the other perspective, right? And maybe then we can respond in a better way, in a context the other person can understand. So whenever we deliver information, why always think about why we do it, right? And that is why we have to design it, and the information has to be designed. Why? To bring about a known outcome. So design the content, design the form, meaning the shape of it, as well as the information architecture, meaning you go to a library, right? And if you ask the librarian where a particular book is, he or she will look at the index and straight away tell you, go to that particular area, that particular rack, that particular place, find the information. So when you lay the information, make sure that lay your information like that. There's some sort of a information hierarchy and information design so the people can find it. And again, deliver by using methods people know. And remember that we are doing this to change a behavior, right? That is why it has to be designed. So if the idea is to make a behavioral change, we have to, once we do the communication, we have to ask, did we communicate to make a change? So what do we have to do? We got to take feedback and we got to measure, right? Everything has to be measurable for us to understand whether it has hit or not. And then, you know, I mean, the look and the feel and the sound of a piece of information. New frontiers will make certain components feel different, right? I mean, uh, how something is delivered will feel different based on the, the platform it is delivered. The look and the sound interpretation is biologically hardwired. Does that make sense? You see, a same bit of information that was delivered hundreds of years ago can now be delivered on a completely different platform, all right? So certain components will feel different, but the look and the sound, right, or the visual impact and the audio impact of the interpretation, what we need to understand is it is biologically hardwired because whatever that comes in has to go through your eyes, has to go through your ears, reach your brain, then only you will be able to perceive it. So the new frontiers make things, they are faster, they are more accessible, they, are, they may be more convenient, right? Although the convenience is contextual, like in the case of the grandma I was talking about. So when we fast forward to the future and talk about new frontiers in medical communication, here's what I want to say fast. Communication is essentially a biological process for which we use technological vehicles. As doctors, we can understand bi these biological basics better than probably anyone else. So let's do that and, you know, go forward. Thank you. And thank you very much, uh, uh, Daniel, and uh, to all our speakers. Uh, given the time, we are pressed for time, uh, we can uh, have one comment. I would suppose I don't know whether Dr. Jeepa is it still online? Yes. Okay. Uh, now, I think uh, 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 Professor Halvathura was uh, um, talking about social distancing happening even before COVID-19 through technology. And then Dinil was explaining about, emphasizing about the importance of communication. Dr. Dujiva, what do you take on this? I, will, I can give you very little, very short time. Can you comment from a medical education's perspective? Just a quick clarification. Uh, you want me to comment about uh, how we can use technology in uh, training for this social distancing or training? No, no, uh, uh, I think Professor Halvatura was explaining about social distancing happening as a result of technology, even before COVID-19, because technology seems to shift us, you know, taking us apart uh, to an extent. 
and even with technology the medical students are now interacting more with technology um, in that sense than with patients if that is the case in the future and then the importance of communication how do you overcome these gaps I suppose uh, well actually you, we have used technology in, in delivery of healthcare with telemedicine uh, and uh, remote robotic uh, surgeries and etc. So uh, I don't think that this is something new. Uh, what happened with COVID is that most of these technologies were used, but I don't think that uh, uh, moving forward, we, we may see more of a hybrid uh, than just using technology and, and uh, in distance modes. But what technology has enabled us is that we, we can now communicate with not only just one student, but we are now using multiple sites and we can act, tap people from expertise from anywhere to help train our students uh, and our residents. Uh, so technology has really helped us to improve uh, communication and also uh, networking. Uh, within within and within a country or within a locality, but also from outside. Uh, one good example is that now when I, I, my uh, center runs a lot of faculty development workshops, previously we had to spend a lot of money to bring experts to the to train just just workshops. But now leveraging on technology, uh, we can actually tap onto the expertise uh, from different countries to train our staff and very similar to our students and, and residents as well. So I think it is the way we use technology and how we incorporate it uh, is important, uh, meaningfully to our programs and also to deliver quality care uh, to our patients. I don't know whether I have answered yeah. your question. I think, uh, Dujipa, I fully agree with you. I mean, it depends on the way that we use it. Nowadays, one thing we have noticed that in Sri Lanka, many medical faculties have moved into online learning, and sometimes as teachers, and also the students have noted that they can interact more. During lectures also, sometimes you can interact, even during this conference, which COVID-19 has forced us to do it in this way, but I think it was a blessing in disguise that a lot of people were coming to SLMA, Vijayarama House, a lot of social interaction, and we could even chat and discuss with the, with the conference participants. So it, it depends on the way that you use it. So I think with that, uh, given that we have very limited time and we have to start off with the next session, I thank uh, the three speakers. Thank you very much, Professor Angika Halvathura. Dr. Dujipu Samarasekara and Dr. Dinil Apegunavardhana. And uh, so uh, let us conclude this session now. And uh, the next uh, we will be having the SC poll memorial oration shortly. And uh, please await. Thank you very much.